you to Our Voices. Today I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Laybon Jones, who's a cardiologist uh, local. Uh, Dr. Jones, welcome to my show. Hibber, thank you for inviting me. Oh, um, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, are you from this area? Born in Arkansas. I actually went to Skyline High uh, in Oakland. Yeah. Uh, I then went to University of California, Berkeley. Oh, go um, Bears. Yep, go Cal go Bears. Bears. There you go, go yeah. <laughs> uh, I then went on to medical school at the University of California, San Diego. Uh -huh. And I came back and did my uh, cardiology fellowship, specialty training at the University of California, Irvine. And I've been here in Solano County since 1985. Oh, how fantastic. I mean, you are just an absolute jewel. I discovered you, I want you to know, I went digging uh, uh, for, I wanted to speak to an uh, African-American physician about some of the issues that face us, both men and women, um, and especially, uh, let's just say in that baby boomer um, stage from 1946 on up to 64. Uh, we have a number of health issues and uh, cardiologists, uh, cardiology seems to top that number one list with obesity. I mean, I, I, I should speak. I, I've lost a total of uh, in the last four years, 65 pounds. Oh, good for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm working very hard. Mm -hmm. I want you to know it's difficult. To, to, yes. to get the rest of that off, but uh, it's a lifestyle change. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the lifestyle changes that we need to make um, not just for today, but for a lifestyle change. Absolutely, and you know, you bring up a good point in regards to getting in shape, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, all of these things that affect African Americans to a greater extent than yes. they do other people. Right. In regards to getting in shape and obesity, by the way, uh, you don't always have to be a size four in order to be in good shape. Oh, okay? that's encouraging. All of the ladies can <laughs> holler for that. I mean, you know, we see all these, we're bombarded. It's like, we got, if we're not like this size four, Yes. I'm never gonna be a size four. No, and most people aren't, but you can still be healthy. That's why nowadays you still see people out of all shapes, sizes, and ages walking in the park, exactly. doing things, and walking, by the way, is one of the best exercises there is. Okay. I want you to know that that's exactly how I started. Uh, in my neighborhood, there is a uh, Japanese couple, mm -hmm. uh, Annette, and, and I call him my sensei. Mm -hmm. And every morning, rain, sleet, snow, doesn't matter. Uh, he would hold her hand, and, and they would just take off mm -hmm. walking. They walked out their front door. So I watched them for two years mm -hmm. now. I to know that. <laughs> and decided to get into it yourself, huh? <laughs> and then I decided to get into it, and that's exactly where I began. I just, I, I you know, a lot of times people, like, I got to go to the gym. I've got to, you know, go get ready. Yes. I put on my my tennis shoes and I walked out my front door. Well, you know, you bring up a good point, and that is, in order to be in shape throughout your life, you have to do something active every almost every single day of your life. Mm -hmm. And it's important nowadays for youth to know and understand this because we have obesity levels now that are very high in teenagers and even kids who are in elementary school, as yes. you know. Yes. Uh, you know, 40 percent of uh, boys, uh, you know, 16 and below are overweight yes. and almost 50 percent of girls oh. in this area yes. and throughout the country with adults, you know, the, the figures are similar. So it's important to understand that um, good habits need to be set early on in life. And that's why I always encourage youth to be active nowadays. Uh, of course, all of them sitting from their computer consoles, their Game Boys, and what have you, and they're very good with their thumbs. But what they're not <laughs> good at doing <laughs> is getting up and walking around. And in addition, our eating habits, because nowadays, every time you turn on a C TV, you see an advertisement for McDonald's and Burger King, what food, have you. Food, 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 food all the time. Food, and it just bombards It's you. the wrong message. And unfortunately, it comes, it, it's cheaper, the, the value menu and so forth, right. it's not quite as healthy as doing some of the things that, that we should do. And, and the habits that we set at this point have an impact later on in life. So it's important that we start these good habits at young ages. I uh, work with uh, Vallejo Senior High School, of course, uh, my, all my children, I graduated uh, from there, mm -hmm. and um, the local principal, he was one of the first uh, interviewees that I had on this show, yes. uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Clarence Isidore. But I see a need for young people to, to have something to do. Now, the, the organized sports, they, they're wonderful, they're good, but people don't have a lot of money. Money, economics mm -hmm. plays such an issue now. And, and I know that uh, when uh, I got custody of m my two grandkids, the first thing that I did was sign them up 
uh, for, for AAU basketball, mm -hmm. I could afford it. Well, I think it's important to recognize that they do need to be physically active. You know, years a day there used to be the President's Council on Physical Fitness, uh -huh. and it was a tremendous program because it encouraged people, kids in school to participate in physical activities and it, depending on the level of achievement then you receive a patch or an award. But the point is it encouraged youth to be active. Right. We don't have that nowadays. In point of fact, in some school systems they don't even require physical education, which At I all. think is uh, unfortunately a disservice to youth everywhere. Being active, among other things, takes you into life with better, a better chance of not being hypertensive, of not being diabetic, of not being overweight, weight, of not having strokes, of not having heart attacks. These are things that I see on an everyday basis. And I can tell you that the majority of people who end up with cardiovascular disease are those who are, of course, hypertensive, mm -hmm. overweight, diabetic, and of course we have to include cigarette smoking in this day and age. And Absolutely. you know, there's a family history, of course, that's important. But in terms of these so-called risk factors mm -hmm. that we can modify, mm -hmm. for instance, being inactive, these are the things that we need to work on. That we mm -hmm. can do. And uh, I, I remember coming up, that was part of the fun of being a young kid, was, was mm -hmm. recess or, yes. you know, going out and being active, playing tetherball and, mm -hmm. and those kind of, the, ki the kids, they Ma don't have that opportunity to do that mm -hmm. now. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I know that the schools are, have so many things on them right now. I mean, the, the list is so long we can't even talk about. But I don't know how to get that back so that we can reach those young kids. I, I know the First Lady, our First Lady has a program um, um, to encourage kids to exercise and to eat right. And, Very good um, program. Mm -hmm. She has a wonderful program, which is teaching them about gardening. I live out by the Loma Vista Farm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, that is just a wonderful, every morning, my puppy and I, we take that walk. <laughs> sure. And, you know, and I go past that farm, and it's very encouraging to see and know where my food comes from sure. and in my backyard. That's what I've started to do. It's very important because kids nowadays think that food comes from the supermarket. Yeah. Most of them have never visited a farm, uh, a dairy. Um, in rural Arkansas, where my parents grew up and where I spent my summers visiting, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have uh, running water. We got our water from a well. Uh -huh. uh, we, if you wanted to have vegetables, then you went out to the garden and got them. We had rows of corn, you know, of greens, of radishes, of tomatoes. Everything came from the farm. Nowadays, everything comes from the supermarket, and most kids don't even realize you know, what, a, uh, what an advantage it is to have those fresh fruits and vegetables, much less where they come from. Where they come from how, and how good they taste. And how good they taste, because you know? they, they are different. Everyone who's, <laughs> who's eaten anything directly from the farm, you know, right there off the vine knows how good it tastes. Exactly, sure. exactly. And, uh, you know, it was wonderful watching my uh, urban night grandchildren from Oakland. I had some uh, bell peppers growing mm -hmm. in, uh, some things, and their little faces were so excited. Grandma said, no, pick some for your granddaddy pick some and, <laughs> and then take some of those peppers over there uh, for your dad because uh, my son wasn't feeling well and he called me he said boy mom he said I put some of those peppers in my food and I just you know I felt much better I said well you know it's we're trying to do eat healthy and this is something that I've done consistently in terms of my kids <laughs> would always laugh and they would say oh lord mama's going on the brown rice diet again <laughs> sure. you know yeah. you know, uh -huh. you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so because when I did I, I'm the cook yes you got to you yes. eat like I, like I eat. Well, you know, good point, because our eating habits are formed early on in life. Mm -hmm. And depending on where you came from, for instance, if you grew up in the South, then you ate a lot of foods that were high in carbohydrates, high in fat, and they weren't always the best parts of the animals. I mean, years ago, many years ago, when African Americans who originally came over right. were in farms and as, as slaves, they were given, given the worst, worst parts of the pig, That's the chicken, right. and so forth. And That's all right. these things nowadays became delicacies. Now everybody <laughs> know knows what, what chitlins are, okay, know, we do. And I'm gonna cook some this <laughs> year for my aunt. She's 96, she asked me, I swear to God, I'm gonna cook this stuff. For, for people who don't know, chitlins are the worst part of the pig. They're actually the intestines, but those were what the African Americans prepared, right. and throughout the years they became a delicacy, so right. to speak. Now, I don't eat any chitlins, okay? I know people who do, but I can tell you that there are other parts of the pig, too, that are just so high in fat, and, and again, the deep frying, uh -huh. things like that. Mm -hmm. Again, I mentioned, you know, high carbohydrates, the breads, and so forth. All of these right. things were used as energy sources because they were the only sources that were available. Exactly. Okay? Nowadays, it's different. Fortunately, we have the ability to make choices in regards to the foods that we eat. 
Uh, but again, our choices are usually formed early on in life. That's why it's important, similarly to, as you mentioned, with the, uh, the president's wife and so forth, mm -hmm. to encourage kids to look at the choices that they make. And then we have to set examples, too, exactly. because we have to, to put the right foods on the table, make sure that they're available in school, not the sodas and so forth, you know, the fresh water and the fruit juices mm -hmm. and so forth. We can't just say, do as I say do, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a soda. But They you know, will learn you from you. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I know they do. Your kids are just like sponges. Whatever yes. you do. Mm -hmm. You know they'll they'll pick up and do it, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so that my uh, my children and I we broke our shoulder habit years mm -hmm. ago. Yes. Uh, that that's one habit that uh, didn't stick around the house long. Uh, when they were young, again I didn't know. I was in my twenties mm -hmm. and thirties, and you know uh, they would have a sandwich and they'd have some soda. But the older we got and the more health conscious I got. Um, I kind of faded that out moved of, them away, uh, moved uh, away from that. Sure. So I, my sons are, are, are pretty healthy, and mm -hmm. they teach their children to, to eat healthy. And yep. so they all love vegetables, yep. and they know where they come from. Uh, and I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I don't want to brag about you, but I do want to brag about you. You were are right now here in Solano County our only African-American cardiologist? Well, there is another gentleman up in the Vacaville area, but I was the first one that came in 1985. Wow. Uh, from Solano County through to the Oregon border and pro border and probably wow. further on. Yes. <laughs> wow, that is, that is a really, really incredible. Here it is, 2013, and Dr. Jones, has your ranks increased or you still in? Well, you know, there are fortunately more coming along. There aren't that many uh, African-American cardiologists in California in general. Uh -huh. You'll see more in the Southern California area, but in Northern California, not a whole lot. Okay. Now, I do a particular type of uh, subspecialty cardiology. I do interventional cardiology, oh. which uh, makes it even more difficult to find uh, African-Americans because there are specialists and there are subspecialists. Uh, the difference with me is uh, I'm the one that you get after they call 911. Okay. okay? Uh, your regular cardiologists will do your treadmills, uh, they'll do your testing, ultrasounds, and so forth. While I treat you when you have your heart attacks, I put stents inside hearts, uh, pacemakers, and defibrillators, and so oh, forth. Okay. So uh, the subspecialty itself is actually fairly, uh, fairly rare. Uh, that being the case, there are very few in numbers, you know, in general. No, mm -hmm. yeah, well, I can, I, I can understand that. It's absolutely a, a specialized field, but I'm so proud of you, and I'm so proud of the fact that you chose this or it chose you because usually that's what happens when we have a passion. We don't choose it. You, you're absolutely right, <laughs> and, and people often ask me, well, why did I go into cardiology? How did I know that? I actually started out uh, in Cal as a computer sciences major, <laughs> and uh, perhaps that wasn't where I was meant to go. <laughs> now, I still enjoy computers now, and I work with them avidly, uh -huh, uh -huh. but uh, it was interesting because I remember at one point, and I guess if I'd been really smart, I probably would have stayed in computer uh, sciences uh, because I would have made bazillions. Yeah, I was going to yes. say bazillions. I yeah. would have probably cashed out by yeah, now, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I wasn't yeah. that smart, and so yeah, I went yeah, to medical school. Yeah. Uh, and I actually discovered that I was uh, inclined to move towards medicine again in college when for some reason I enjoyed the intensity of, of medicine. I started out taking, you know, histology and, mm -hmm. you know, pathology and things like that. And ultimately, once I got into medical school, uh, I discovered that I liked the type of medicine that was more intense, more acute. And I also noticed that when patients were the sickest and then the ICU and then the, the CCU and so forth, that the doctors that they turned to the most often were the cardiologists, and they uh -huh. seemed to be the smartest, and they seemed to be the ones that uh, always maintained their cool. Mm -hmm. When patients went into cardiac arrest, they were the ones who were there and took care of the patients. Well, I ended up gravitating towards that type of medicine, and I felt very comfortable with it. And oftentimes when I'm asked, is your job stressful, I always say, I don't believe my, my job is stressful. I mean, this is what I was blessed with, and this is what I do. And so what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, of course, is just part of what I was blessed uh, to do. And so I don't consider it very stressful at all. No, you, mm -hmm. you, you know, passion. Mm -hmm. When you have a passion and, and you are chosen for something or it chooses you, mm -hmm. it, there's nothing you can do about it. You yeah. just have to. Th so you that really is flow. true. And you know, everyone has a gift. You know, when I do motivational speaking for kids at the junior high school level, elementary school level, high school level, I remind them that everyone has a gift that God has given them. It's a matter of discovering what that is, whether it be a, an artist, as a teacher, as an attorney. You know, the point is that if you can find your gift, 
and enjoy your life doing it, make a reasonable living at doing it, then you're truly blessed. Oh boy. And it's important to be able to, to find that. And, and, and what's a tragedy, or oftentimes, uh, you know, horrible, is when someone has a gift and they throw it away. Uh, you know, there are people who have gifts as, as athletes, and, you know, they are far and few between. Mm -hmm. uh, and I oftentimes have this discussion sometimes in regards to professional athletes, because as you know, uh, many African Americans aspire towards being professional athletes. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and unfortunately, that is such an unrealistic role model. And mm -hmm. I don't really consider professional athletes role models. Mm -hmm. um, Arthur Ashe, whom you may know from years ago, uh, mm -hmm. one of the first African American tennis players, uh, had an article in the Parade magazine, which is still in Sunday newspapers, but it was about African Americans in sports. Mm -hmm. And one of the statistics that he brought up was that only one in every 10,000 kids who aspires to be a professional athlete actually makes it, gets a chance. And the question that he posed to their parents was, do you want your child to be that one? And of course they said yes. Or do you want your child to risk being one of the 9,999? And unfortunately that's where they turn out. So. Uh, I have coached uh, basketball at the middle mm -hmm. school level mm -hmm. there in Venetia, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I always encourage them to do is to keep your grades up because if you're making C's and D's instead of A's and B's, you belong in the library, not in the gym. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, too many kids find other distractions, whether it be playing basketball, football, or their Game Boys, as I mentioned, whatever, computers. Whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. that is not what, what in, what's going to get them through life. And no. it's important that they realize that you cannot go through life being a professional athlete or aspiring, aspiring to be a uh, professional athlete. Aspiring. You know, and, that's, and they have, it's like they, they have this, this thought process in that, okay, this is it and this is what we're going to do. Well, I can tell you from watching my kids from 10 years old being on this AAU circuit and watching those parents being so avid and, and just taking them and putting them in all those basketball camps and doing this all is what of they those see. different things. Yeah. And, you know, and they're acting like, and I, I'm like, I was doing it because I wanted mm -hmm. the kids to sure. have a physical outlet. Yes, and that's what's important to realize, that it should be for a physical outlet. You know, when you turn on the TV, you see LeBron James, and again, a wonderful uh, man. You never see him in trouble or anything like that. Right, right. Other athletes have had their issues and so forth. But the point is, those are the ones who are in the limelight all of the time. They get these shoe ad endorsements. Mm -hmm. You know, they tend to get uh, all of the, you know, uh, the, the videos, what have you, you know, and so forth. Own, own but that's so unrealistic, and, and that is yes. not true life, unfortunately. No. And many kids get caught up in that, just as they do wanting to do rap music and so forth. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any type of music, but remember, do that for fun, not for your life. Exactly. There aren't that many people that they are going to say, oh, I'm going to be a hip hop artist. Excuse me. There's only one E40. Right, right. And I'm, I know his mom and I know his dad. He exactly. Okay, his grandparents. Sure. We all mm -hmm. grew up together. As a matter of fact, he's mm -hmm. the same age as my oldest son. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, you know, what we need to to uh, do is uh, uh, encourage our young people uh, to, to have dreams and to dream wider than just what they see in front of in front of them, their Game Boy. That the, there's unlimited things that people can do with their lives if you just you know open up and, and, and reach out a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about men and, and their health issues. Um, <clears throat> uh, you and I were discussing earlier about that banks of denial that mm -hmm. a lot of men live on. Uh, sure. I, I adore my husband and mm -hmm. uh, right now I believe he's residing on the banks of denial yes. and mm -hmm. I'm trying to hand him a paddle and mm -hmm. you know kick him off of it. Sure yeah <laughs> well you know many men do uh, unfortunately uh, being married to someone for 47 years you know <laughs> that uh, men can be stubborn. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately that stubbornness can lead to some serious health issues because as we get older, we develop problems as other people do, similarly in high blood pressure. Uh, men in particular develop uh, issues with their prostate and so forth. Uh, there are a lot of health issues that need to be attended to and what it requires of course is that we not only acknowledge the fact that we are human and eventually our bodies are going to break down, but we also need to recognize that we need to maintain our health by vigilance and by that I mean regular checkups in addition to the exercise and acknowledging the problems that we have. Now, high blood pressure is much more prevalent in the African American population than it is in the Caucasian population. So as many as 65, 70 percent of African Americans above the age of 55 have high blood pressure. Uh, high blood pressure is something that naturally comes with age because as our large blood vessels, the arteries become stiffer, the pressure inside goes okay. up. The problem is the stiffer those arteries become, the higher our pressures become, the more likely we are to not only have heart attacks but also strokes. And we can keep those 
the entities down and to a lesser extent mm -hmm. by controlling our blood pressures. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means, of course, is knowing and understanding what types of things we can do to lower our blood pressure. One of the first things that we always talk to patients about, especially men, is exercise. That is, uh, losing some of that uh, weight, becoming active. That's number one. Number two is the things that we can do, changing our diet, avoiding a lot of uh, salt in our diet, because people put a lot of salt in diet. Mm -hmm. um, making sure that if we have uh, signs and symptoms of diabetes, that that is controlled, among other things. And then treating things in the manner in which we can. So high blood pressure, for instance. if We've taken care of those things. If we ask them to lose weight, to exercise, and so forth, they've, they've done everything that they can to get their blood pressures down. Then we have to start realistically looking at medication. Mm -hmm. Now, no one wants to take medication, and that's similar to someone telling, uh, when I tell them they need an operation, they say, well, I don't want an operation. Well, uh, no, no one, oh, no yeah, one wants want an operation. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you may yeah. need one to save your life, <laughs> <Right. laughs> just as you may need high blood pressure people pills. people say that. Oh, no, I, I don't want an operation. Yeah. Okay, but I'm in the line for the operation. Exactly. You know? <laughs> right. And you, but you may need one to save your life, just as you may need high blood pressure medication to save right. your life. There's no right. shame to taking medication. Right. First of all, the medications that we have nowadays are almost inconsequential, and by that I mean many of them are without side effects completely. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest reasons that people did not take medications years ago was because the medications that were given to treat high blood pressure were often worse than the high blood pressure themselves. Okay. They were too sleepy. They felt... Uh, among other things, as if they were dragging. They made them feel as if they weren't motivated, I right? Tired hearing, all the time. I remember time, hearing so that from some of my elders, you know, they sure. since passed on, but I do remember hearing those types of, come on, I'm not going to take that high blood pressure sure. pill. That high blood, I get dizzy when I take that high blood pressure pill. Well, one of the biggest reasons that men refused to take high blood pressure uh, medication was because many of the medications cause erectile dysfunction, uh -huh. okay? Mm -hmm. And again, you mm -hmm. give a man a medication for something like that, they're not going to take it. No. Uh, but when medications have side effects, that means that the risks outweigh the benefits. Well, nowadays with medications that we have, particularly as in that we design medications for every individual, you uh -huh. know, what I give an African American would be difficult, uh, different from what I give a Caucasian person or even an Asian person because uh -huh. we all have different bodily systems, although mm -hmm. we're same in, in, in some regards. Mm -hmm. But the point is we can give you medication that not only treats your blood pressure, keeps it down, but then puts you at a lesser risk to having heart attacks and strokes that you won't even know that you're taking. So it's important that you take your medication and not even know that you're taking it so that you are benefiting from it. And with all of the goings on that's going on about smoking, I am so shocked that people are still smoking. I have to say, I'm a, in defense, I'm an ex-smoker, mm -hmm. okay? I stopped back in 88, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, it's been years ago since I stopped, but I was an avid smoker mm -hmm. and, you know, I didn't want nobody to tell me anything. But as I see people now, now you, you, you've been ostracized. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't even stand outside the restaurants. Right. And I mean, everywhere you go. And now you're paying $5 a pack or $6 a pack, but you're impacting your health so much more. Exactly. And you know, it's interesting because years ago, of course, of course post-World War II or during the war, everybody smoked. Cigarettes were very cheap. They were a nickel a pack and so forth. And so when I started, you know, our, they were our grandparents smoked, mm -hmm. parents smoked and so forth. Mm -hmm. But back then, of course, the tobacco companies were telling us that smoking, in fact, was healthy. In fact, <laughs> right. uh, I remember <laughs> it's the menthol advertisement said that they cleared your lungs. Well, yeah. of course, we know that isn't <laughs> right. the case. And we know that people who smoke not only have higher <laughs> right, incidence right. of lung disease, <laughs> you know, lung cancer, but heart attacks and, and strokes. And so as we've learned these things, it's interesting that now in the educational system, you know, when your grandkids come home now, I'm sure they will tell you they've been taught to stay away from cigarette oh, smoking yes. and oh, to yes. tell their parents th to not smoke and so forth. So it's important to understand that, you know, smoking uh, used to be popular. Nowadays, we recognize its impact. And even for parents who smoke and say they smoke outside of the house, well, it doesn't do any good because the cigarette smoke is in their hair, their skin, and so forth. And children or parents who smoke have a greater incidence of pneumonia, bronchitis, and lung disease than other kids who don't, who, whose parents don't smoke. Plain, pure, and simple. Oh, Dr. Jones, mm -hmm. I, I, I could really have about 10 other questions that I could uh, uh, talk to you about. So later on this year, I'm going to ask you to come back, and we're going to do a second half of this show because I am just really, really uh, adamant about health mm -hmm. and our health issues as they affect us and how we can how we can start to begin to change our lifestyle and, and I'll talk about my story mm -hmm. at that second half and Absolutely. how I, I changed it mm -hmm. and how I would like to help other people to learn how to change it. Dr. Jones, thank you so much. This yep. has been an absolute
pleasure for me to have this conversation with you. You're so informative. You have so much information to bring to the community. And I want to let you know that I, I think that you're an absolute jewel. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. And uh, certainly, I'm happy to work with you on these subjects because it's our community, it's our lives, and it's our people. It's our people. Thank you so much. My pleasure. This is Deborah thanking you again for a wonderful, wonderful show. Our Voices, we'll see you. This is the first show of 2013. Thank you so much. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful week.